that. I came across a lot of connections that had to do with Trump and what you might say is a kind of extra uh, qualities that he has that don't really come to the surface when you're watching him in his normal political environment, uh, including his background. And as I went deeper into it, of course, um, one of the main things that Trump is known for, John Trump, is he is, um, you know, the guy that the FBI called to say, we need you to go through Nikola Tesla's papers when Tesla died. The deep state that he's referring to is a system that operates. Uh, it's a coordinated system that involves organized crime. It involves Wall Street. It involves oil uh, companies. And it involves those forces working in concert together, along with the intelligence agencies and the contracting agencies for those intelligence agencies. For Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. I have a really interesting show lined up with dark journalist Daniel Linst. He has been doing this series called the X Series. And during that process, he has uncovered a lot of interesting things about Trump's background. Information that you haven't heard anywhere in the media. He's been looking through National Archives and other information that is public, but in the National Archives on his ancestors. And he has found some really interesting deep state ties that Trump and he has in his family. And he's going to share that with us today. And then he also talks about some other interesting things that he's uncovered with this X series and what this X series is really about. And then after that, he sticks around and talks about what he's learned about Bush's ancestors, not just about his recent ancestors, but all the way back to the mid 1800s. Believe it or not, his Bush's ancestor is one called George Bush, who actually was the first recorded Zionist. Very interesting background. And he explains his background to my patrons. So he, he answers another question about that, but I'm gonna have him back and he's gonna dive more into that in a later interview. But for now, he gives a overview for my patrons. So I have the link here. If you are a patron, you can see that. And very fascinating information. And I think you're gonna like this. And I wanna tell you, for my patrons who've been supporting me, thank you so much. You are the reason this channel keeps going and I am, I am so grateful. So that's why all of my guests, I have them stay after and ask another question. And it's been just a really great process. And so now I have over 30 interviews up there for people. And I have three books, my two books, and then one of my guests, John J. Singleton, also released his book for my Patreon. So there's a lot of information that's starting to pile up there for people who support the show. So thank you so much for that. And let's get into now my interview with dark journalist Daniel Linst. Hi, Daniel. Welcome back to the program. Hey, Sarah. It's great to see you. It's been so long since uh, you've been on, and I'm so glad that you're back. There is so much that I want to talk to you about, but I want to talk about these amazing things that you bring. I mean, you've done some amazing work over the last couple of years from the Egyptian artifacts that you brought forward, which should have over 50 million views, which I, it still did well for you, but should be up to over 50 million views. Oh, yeah. But, you know, that's crazy. But you have been talking about Trump's background and his deep state ties that people don't probably no one's really aware of it hasn't been I haven't heard it until you brought it forward can you give us kind of a brief overview of that and then we can be you know before we dive really deep into it oh yeah absolutely uh it's it is great to see again you know you're uh, one thing I want to comment on is your show has just grown by leaps and bounds and you're doing uh fantastic stuff and it's always great to see you know I mean we've been friends for a while but I I think the show really over the last course uh, of the last year has really uh taken on incredible dimensions so you're doing fantastic well, thank you thank you and I remember when I first started and people don't aren't aware of this I was watching you when I called you and I said can you just help me and give me some pointers <laughs> <laughs> and you were so kind to do that so you'll oh, yeah. always be you know in my my debt yeah. here 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, your stuff's great because you have such a foundation in business. And I always say if you know business and understand business, everything else makes sense when you get into media, you know. Yeah, and, uh, well, everything's so, business, in it? Right, right, yes. It all yeah. trails back there, as we know. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting what you're saying about the deep state uh, and the connections I've found with Trump. I've been doing an X series, which follows this kind of steganography of the X and um, through these different projects and mostly black budget projects uh, that the US government has had going on really over the course of the last 70, 75 years. And um, they've really kind of run the show, I would say, because they've driven the financial situation, the geopolitical situation. We've been kind of in that environment. So um, what I found when I was researching these projects that would go black is that this X would turn up as part of the naming convention for different types of things. Um, and so a lot of the projects that would go into the black budget that dealt with advanced aircraft, suddenly they all got an X designation. Uh, so I've gone pretty deep into it. Uh, some of the paperclip scientists that we brought here, like Walter Dornberger, for example, out of that Nazi program, uh, some of his incredible X program research has given us you know, even the space planes that he ran in the 60s still hold the records for speed, even now, um, because they were designed to just be supersonic. So uh, it started to bother me, though, that all of the black budget projects would turn up with this X designation. So I've been trailing it for a few years, and I, I came out with that series only in the past couple of months. And we were doing our 10th episode of that. And um, while doing that, I came across a lot of connections that had to do with Trump and what you might say is a kind of extra uh, qualities that he has that don't really come to the surface when you're watching him in his normal political environment, uh, including his background. And a lot of that family background uh, had to do with John Trump, who was his uncle and who, according to Trump's account, he's very close to. And um, John Trump was, was right from around here. You know, MIT is about 10 minutes in that direction. And all of his archives are just sitting there waiting. And uh, so I spent some time with those. And what I found, um, you know, one of the things about John Trump is that he was a professor of engineering and at MIT, but he was on a very high level. You know, they, ha they have a number of guys who do that, but he was really one of their main go-to people. And the first thing that, that kind of struck me about him was that his protege, uh, well, he was the protege of Vannevar Bush, who was the dean of the MIT Engineering School, who went on to um, really have a major role in the National Science Department. He was just the go-to man for the government on science. And I thought, well, that's a pretty interesting connection because Vannevar Bush shows up in all the UFO file uh, stories like MJ-12 and in some government documents on the Canadian side that refer to the American program dealing with uh, advanced technology around the UFO file, Vannevar Bush is the go-to man. And I was like, well, John Trump and Vannevar Bush together, you know, working around this UFO file seemed to me to be something to follow up on. And as I went deeper into it, of course, um, one of the main things that Trump is known for, John Trump, is he is, um, you know, the guy that the FBI called to say, we need you to go through Nikola Tesla's papers when Tesla died. And uh, this is significant, I think, for a few reasons. One is you have to imagine the level that somebody would be on for them, for the FBI to say, you know, Tesla, who was one of the most major inventors of the 20th century, um, they were particularly concerned about something called the Tesla death ray, and um, they were aware by doing their own surveillance on Tesla that he may in fact have this information uh, sort of hanging out there that someone might have been able to get their hands on it. So they wanted Trump to go through his papers. So they broke into his hotel room. And uh, in fact, Trump went through the papers for them and the FBI people said to him, what we're looking for is information about a device and a type of technology that can pull down, quote, flying objects at a great distance. So for example, if you and I were in San Diego and we wanted to pull down a flying object that was over the UK, uh, this is the type of technology that he was working on. 
And so they knew he was working on it. They, they weren't aware of how far he'd gotten. And so it's all rather fascinating the way this went down because as it turned out, um, he went through all that material and he said, well, there was nothing in the material that was about the death ray. And um, as it turned out, the FBI, when looking into the situation, they'd been in touch with Vannevar Bush and that's how they came up with Trump's name because Trump was Vannevar Bush's protege. So that gives us a, a pretty good idea of the depths of connections that John Trump had. And uh, I think when we get into looking at that, just right off the bat, we know that, um, you know, one of the quotes that Trump has about his uncle is that he told me about nuclear before nuclear was real. So um, that type of sharing secrets thing, Trump may have been somebody, President Trump, who really knew a lot about that end of the spectrum. And it's my contention generally that that advanced technology has fueled the direction of the political process over the, the course of the past 70 years. So wouldn't you say that this whole thing frames Trump differently? I mean, what they tried to do during the election was to say he was an independent, self-made billionaire, which we knew he had a father that was really active in real estate and successful, and Trump was given a huge step up. But this frames them as not only, you know, them being successful in real estate before, but they had deep state ties and... Trump knows a lot more about what's going on in the deep state than people are aware of. Oh, absolutely. And I think that there's an aspect of the deep state that actually supports him. Uh, this is the aspect that Peter Dale Scott, who coined the term the deep state, uh, he calls it the America first. Uh, so it's the National Association of Manufacturers, that whole group, uh, and elements of the mafia also who skew towards being uh, more on the patriotic side by nature. And one of the things that they have in common with Trump is they wanted to get rid of the Obama mandate and they wanted the ability uh, to make it possible for people to go to their casinos and to have that kind of uh, interaction again because they were losing that because in Obama's world, when people were paying for the health mandate and all that, they didn't have any free money to go do things with. <laughs> so they certainly had logical on the ground reasons for backing Trump. But Trump's connections also, if you are a major builder in New York City, you're going to need some kind of mafia uh, connection. And of course, both sides, Republicans and Democrats, have to square uh, their games with organized crime because those are major political donors and they you know, they do a lot of fixing in the in the voting uh, department, but that's been going on really since the 60s. There's a great book that talks about Nixon and Kennedy sort of dishing out the money at the last minute and buying every district they can for votes. And that's just the way the political process has run. And if anything, I think it's probably gotten worse since then. Um, but it's interesting, if you wanna look at Trump really from a deep state perspective, I had someone come on the show, um, in mid-February, and his name was Robert Merritt, and he was a agent who worked for the Houston plan under Nixon. And he was a totally undercover agent, um, but I was able to track his background and the fact that he was interviewed by Archibald Cox and the special prosecutor in Watergate. He had quite a paper trail. So he wasn't one of these guys that just showed up out of the blue. Um, but there's a very interesting link to Trump and Nixon, which no one really was aware of. I certainly wasn't before I researched it. And um, according to, to Merritt, Nixon knew a great deal about 
deep politics, but he also knew a great deal about advanced technology. And he was planning on uh, imparting this information, basically, and creating a new energy system uh, in the 70s when they were faced with the oil crisis. And um, so for many different reasons, Watergate happened, that being one of them, which is these figures in the deep state didn't want this technology getting out to the public at the time. And Merritt was kind of in the middle of all this. Um, but one of the things that came out was that in the 80s, Trump knew Nixon, and they became good friends. And I found correspondence to this effect. So there's a letter in the National Archives that shows Nixon writing to Trump and saying, you have to run for president because I'll predict you'll win. And um, then, you know, I've found these pictures of Nixon and Trump together in the 1987 doing these fundraisers. Interestingly enough, with John Connolly, who was the governor of Texas when Kennedy was assassinated, he was actually in the car. And all three of them together there formed quite a picture in my mind. And if you you do research around this stuff long enough, you get to understand the clicks. Do you have the, that the, picture? Can we yeah, see it? I, yeah, absolutely. I've got it handy here. You can direct me as to if you take a good look at that. That's Nixon over here. And that's John Connolly in the middle. And of course, Trump and his wife, Ivana, at the time. They're all there together. And um, it is it does cut quite a look. And this is the letter from the National Archives that has Trump writing, uh, Nixon writing to Trump and saying, Dear Donald, you need to run for office. You're going to be a winner. So um, we have this kind of substantive trail of Nixon and Trump that really no one's ever put together. But I think it gives us an idea about Trump's aspirations for the presidency and the level of knowledge that he had going in about some of the deeper kind of black budget, deep state topics. Uh, and Nixon, of course, was an expert on, on both of those. Well, and how did you get this information? I, you didn't just stumble. I mean, you did a lot of research, right? I, yeah, how the first did you thing, find this stuff? The first thing I did, uh, the, the big key is, uh, I think when you go after these types of details, you need to see what's publicly available and then go one level deeper to see if there's un any university papers that refer to it and maybe things that are left out in the public. And I call them stealth archives. So there's an archive, for example, there's a letter at the LBJ library called X. And it contains something that LBJ wants to get out 50 years after his death. So he died in 1973, and that puts the letter and the information in the letter out in 2023. And that's one that we're waiting for. Um, another stealth archive was Nixon, uh, of course, according to Robert Merritt, had a time capsule that he placed in the White House that he wanted to come out at some point, and that that information referred to his activities involving advanced technology and the UFO file. So these presidents uh, keep this information because when that larger picture comes out, if it ever does, they want their role to be disclosed. So these stealth archives are something that are within the public, uh, that is we can see them, but we can't actually put our hands on them, just like the LBJ letter. Now Eisenhower, as it turned out, had a time capsule, a hundred year time capsule that he placed at his Gettysburg farm in Pennsylvania to be opened in a hundred years. That's 1953. So that one opens in 2053, but he called it Project X. So we, we this X um, steganography, and I want to explain steganography a little bit so that we all understand, like, you know, there's, there's cryptology, which is something like Morse code or even the Enigma machine that they had during World War II that the Germans were the best at hiding uh, their messages going back and forth. Um, that's a, a kind of thing where you know something's being hidden and you spend hours and hours trying to figure out what the code is and all the rest of it. Steganography is exactly the opposite. It is something that's hidden in plain sight that you don't know is a code, but that people who go to do the research and who, who understand, they will see it and they will know. So, um, for example, I always refer to this scene that's in, um, The Falcon and the Snowman, which is this movie about... Uh, information coming through Pine Gap, Australia, 
into the U.S. intelligence agencies and being intercepted there by one of the people who got into all this trouble. But he was upset because he saw the CIA meddling in the affairs of Australia. Um, so what he would do is he would place an X on these signposts and the spies who were going to meet him would know to meet him at a certain time. So for you and me walking by, just seeing an X there, it wouldn't mean anything. But for them, they understand it. So that's how steganography works. And if you go into a lot of older documents, like ancient documents, when they needed to keep secrets and move things along, that pattern is always hidden in there. Uh, there's always a steganography for different things uh, that they're referring to, because uh, even people like Shakespeare and Nostradamus, there were certain things they couldn't talk about openly that they would refer to in their writings to get around kind of like a Catholic persecution or whatever, a political persecution. So something that might just be benign, like you're, you're thinking this really isn't that big of a deal, could have immense information for certain people in it. There's no question. And uh, what I've done in the series is tracked the ex-steganography, which I'll tell you, is replete through all the secrecy that the U.S. government has around advanced technology and black budget programs. Over and over again, the X shows up. And um, what it tells me is that even in some of the earliest cases of the FBI doing things, the Tesla file, for example, contains all these Xs. And somebody could say when looking at those files, well, you know, you're going to use an X for this and say X unknown. Of course, there are practical uses for it. That's the point with steganography. It's, it's not something like we're only looking for the things that actually apply to the story. And uh, so for things that are just there for the heck of it, they need to look normal. So, yes, you know, you're going to use X for certain types of car series or whatever it happens to be. But you also might be able to use something as simple as X for a number of different intelligence agencies to follow the same thing without briefing them all to the same level. So I can actually give you communication about a particular project. I can bring you in on a black budget project. Um, technology project, for example, and have you follow when these X series uh, technologies come out. So right now we have the X37B, uh, you've got SpaceX. There's a number of technology movements that are happening that are related to uh, this black budget technology that they've kept hidden for a good, a good long period of time, uh, in my estimation, longer than 70 years. Um, but at least we can count from there. Well, do you, has there been any stealth capsules that have been opened or um, in history, or is the first one Eisenhower's? Well, no, uh, none of the none of the time capsules that are stealth archives have been opened. Uh, Eisenhower's will open in twenty fifty three. LBJ's uh, X letter is a stealth archive, and that is set to be open in five years. That's twenty twenty three. Now. Um, they they went to open the letter in the 90s, and it was a very interesting tussle because Nixon was had died, and they thought, um, you know, there were a lot of things coming out, and they thought maybe the letter relates to LBJ and Nixon. So there were some references to Nixon and Spiro Agnew in New Mexico in the in the LBJ letter. So there was all this thing about did LBJ uh, spy on Nixon and and all these types of things. But I think what it it gets into is they released one letter and uh, the other 14 pages they kept. So they said, well, well, we'll release these actually when the time comes. So for some reason, they put out this one page of it. Um, and so we never really we don't understand the real thrust of the letter X. Now, what's interesting when you're looking at all this information, because when you get into a research mode, it starts to make a lot more sense, is that when we had recently Trump looking at the JFK files and saying, I can't release them, which is a major legal issue because Congress had already voted in 1992 to release yeah, the record. I ask you about this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, just yeah, waiting. I'm jumping ahead Perfect. Of you. No, perfect. <laughs> um, but that's the, those stealth archives and the information and the ability for researchers to connect the programs that they were using are in those documents. So when well, they're held is, back, yeah, they're, so they're stealth. That's right? an issue, right? I mean, because that... You're you're one of the foremost experts on the JFK. You've done a HBO special on JFK yeah. when when the archives are going to come. Now they were supposed to release them, and then they decided not to. So that's a constitutional problem, 
and why yes. do you think they haven't and what what you know what power do we have to make them do this well the power was through congress which mandated it and that's the cia that blocked it on on numerous occasions um but in this case what happened was the JFK movie in 1992 that Oliver Stone made created a big ruckus in the public and people started to understand. They always knew. I mean, it's always been 70 percent that the Warren Commission was a lie if you took any poll of the American people. Um, so we knew that they were protecting a secret. What was the secret? Well, Oswald didn't shoot alone. In fact, he probably wasn't involved with the plot at all. So who was and what was it all about? And um, they always had this kind of pretend curtain that, oh, it was the Russians that were involved and there was never any evidence for it. So who were they actually protecting? Well, obviously, there's an intelligence agency trail back to the JFK assassination, which represents elements of the deep state. Uh, you know, Peter Dale Scott has a book where he calls the JFK assassination the first revolt against the White House from by the deep state. So... Um, and it's probably worthwhile to just take a look at his definition of the deep state here, which is very it's not different. Sean from... Hannity's definition, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That pr I what mean, they're purposely trying to make you think it's something else. So I'm oh, glad yeah. you're going to define it. I think it needs to be. Um, I mean, it's Peter Dale Scott who coined the term. So, you know, he's the UC Berkeley professor. He's been on my show a number of times and at 88 now he's still writing. Um, uh, and uh, I've talked to him about how they've misused his deep state term, and he's he's very aware of how they've done it. But the deep state that he's referring to is a system that operates. Uh, it's a coordinated system that involves organized crime. It involves Wall Street. It involves oil uh, companies, and it involves those forces working in concert together, along with the intelligence agencies and the contracting agencies for those intelligence agencies. For example, the CIA needs something done. They hire out Booz Allen Hamilton to do surveillance on a particular group. They don't do it themselves. Um, they get around laws by doing this because, you know, the CIA uh, doesn't have any mandate to spy domestically in the United States. So, um, so those forces form a system, a kind of shadow system of power that's parallel with the public state. So you have a covert site, uh, a covert state operating underneath the regular state, and then you have the public state, the overt state on top. And once in a while, that deep state needs to do something to change public policy. So they have to kind of move into the public state. And when they do, uh, these connections get exposed temporarily. We get a look at them and then they go back under this into this covert uh, system. So we've seen it over and over again when we've tried to crack uh, these deep events that have happened, like Iran-Contra, uh, you know, like Watergate, like the JFK assassination, like 9-11. It seems like there's this other system operating, which is kind of extra constitutional, that they have their own people in place. And that when they decide to get together and make a decision that something has to happen, this public policy needs to be changed, then they coordinate to do that. And um, so the deep state is not, has nothing to do with bureaucrats who stay in through different administrations, which is what Sean Hannity and it's Rachel Maddow. It's not the Maddow. postmaster who's been working there for 25 <laughs> right, years. Right, yeah. And I think that's interesting too, because you can see how in the mainstream media, they get it wrong, but in the alternative media, they don't take the time to explain it because the, the deep state isn't a right or left issue. It's not a Democrat Republican group. And, um, you know, you and I have talked a lot about things like, uh, the Q type people and, and, uh, that kind of big push from the side saying the deep state is going to wipe out the Democrats, you know, um, because, uh, and, and then there's this other side that says, don't worry, you know, we're going to wipe out the deep state and the Democrats. So that's when it, that gives you a hint. If it's, it's if yes. it's partisan, then, you know, it's not serious. Yes, absolutely. Because there isn't any right or left with the deep state. They're just a group, a system, a power system, a parallel power system. And I think uh, they will operate 
you know, look, we had JFK that they operated against. He was a Democrat. Well, the deep state operated against Trump trying to keep him out of office. And then the first year of his administration, they really tried to railroad him. Um, so they, you know, he's a Republican now. So therefore, you know, we've seen the deep state go after Republicans and Democrats. It's whoever isn't towing the line. Well, he uh, seems like he's really captured now. I mean, well, I don't have, know. Yes. I mean, <laughs> he seems really captured. Oh, Basically, I absolutely agree go, with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, at this point, Trump, um, see, it's interesting because Trump started with a lot of promise. And yes, uh, he did. Him, I think him beating Hillary was significant in the sense that the alternative media had a great role in that because they were so good um, at exposing the Clinton Foundation and things along this line and the Seth Rich case and WikiLeaks and all these different things opened up. But uh, it was close. It was razor thin. And Trump came in, I think, with the the mandate of the people who got him in, which was to change things. Yes, and I did. Think in the, yeah. And in the first year, I think he had a good opportunity to do that. But when we look at Trump um, getting rid of people like Rex Tillerson, uh, the kind of sounder minds in the administration, when you look at people like Mattis, uh, you know, the – Bringing people on like John Bolton and uh, the new CIA director who was in charge of rendition and torture and things like that, it's a totally bad direction. And you and I were talking about how pulling out of the Iran deal, it's something that makes the president's uh, future look very well, much in the jeopardy. Pro the problem with the Iran deal isn't just pulling out of the Iran deal. It's the pulling out without having having a negotiated deal that our plan for a negotiated deal in place. Now, everybody's mad, unless it's some orchestrated circus on purpose. The other thing that's a problem is the the troops that are all aligned around Jordan and Israel attacking Syria and the, and yeah. then the mass the mass um, sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. So it's this huge buildup of war along with pulling out the, of the Iran, Iran deal, deal that's the problem, you know? So now they're all positioned to go to war. That yeah. is what's scary. No, no, there's no question. Um, well, they've been after Syria for all these years, yes. right? And and let's face it, Obama acted exactly the same way. Yes, he did. You know, he was he was bombing Libya. He was sending fighters, uh, you know, supporting groups against Assad in Syria. And but he wonder, was deep state, though, right? I mean, we knew that yes. he was captured by the deep state. No question. Trump came in the office saying, "We got to stop doing yes. all this stuff. Yes. We don't." And so, people, so many people liked him because no one, you know, the surveys I, I came out. Impression, yeah, yeah. And now he's like 180 degrees the other direction. I think a lot of things, a lot of forces have moved on Trump, so that we're not seeing the same guy who got into office. I think the uh, Mueller probe used a lot of deep state shenanigans. I think they used the whole phony Russia collusion thing. You see, none of these narratives make any sense. And I was watching, uh, there was a whole thing on MSNBC. MSNBC has pushed the Russian collusion narrative on one hand. But on the other hand, uh, they're pushing this whole thing about, oh, Trump is pulling out of the Iran deal. Well, which one is it? Because if he's colluding with Russia, then he doesn't want to bomb Iran because it, Russia is tight with Iran. And yes. if he's with Russia, then he would want to kiss up to Iran. You wouldn't take them out of the deal. So none of their um, nothing kind of, makes sense. No, no. It and doesn't. the Korea is coming together. You know, I mean, it's like everything. It's, things just aren't. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It's almost like they needed to have the Korea part set before they moved in on the Iran part. Yes. Uh, but you and I know from the types of things that we study that so much of this is about getting a world currency mm -hmm. going. Yeah. A I know. one world mm -hmm. digital. Uh, currency. So which is why the same day that you have Trump pulling out of the Iran deal and really sounding like G.W. Bush, I mean, you know, saying that the Iranians have captured hostages of America in the past, you know, yeah, I mean, that was 1979. Oh, it was all BS. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. His story right. of why we're going in Iran was such a joke. But yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, well, and we know that Bush and all the rhetoric about the evildoers and all those, that's what Trump sounded like, unfortunately. Yes, he did, yeah. Um, so that's Bolton's influence, I think. And uh, I think what the people who have supported Trump and helped him get this far need to send him a message 
that the Bush era neocons uh, are not the people that he wants to represent him. The other thing that he can do, you know, it was funny to me that he went along with the CIA on the JFK block because he can actually, you know, hold them out to dry a little bit by um, putting those files out. It gives him a better, stronger position because I guarantee you in the JFK files is information that will show that the CIA has operated in extra constitutional fashion. That's what I and wanted to ask you was why, yeah. you know, get some of the what's really in there. Oh, what are they hiding the files for? Yeah. And you're saying it's because it's showing that the CIA will keep, keep going. Well, it's fascinating uh, that you mention it that way because Jefferson Morley, who is the Washington Post reporter who quit the Washington Post to um, do his JFK research, he decided to sue the CIA for the records, which is fascinating. And that when lawsuit, did he do when? He actually did that in 2011. Um, and but the records that he's looking for aren't even in the batch that Trump is trying to dispatch. They relate to someone named George Janides, who uh, was basically in charge of the Oswald project, and no one knew that that he even existed. So those aren't Trump. supposed to be kept, and they are. Exactly right. They're not even part of the uh, 1992 mandated files. So we have an interesting situation. Uh, I think we should snapshot the Kennedy thing for a moment, though, here. In America, we had five different investigations of the Kennedy assassination. You had the Warren Commission, which concluded it was Oswald alone, uh, which is ridiculous. And they never well, provided And, and the, the person who ran it was the one who Kennedy fired, right? I mean, it was such a joke. It was run by the CIA's Alan Dulles. Yeah, who he fired. Who he fired because they tried to drag him into a war in Cuba. And he fired him the first year he got in, which is that's what set off the real battle between Kennedy and the CIA, which is fascinating. And it is something that I've tracked a lot in my reports. But I think when you look at it, the next investigation that's major is the Jim Garrison investigation, who was the New Orleans DA um, and this comes around full circle because in 1992, it was Oliver Stone who made the film about Garrison that got the records to be opened up. And when they said, hey, open up the records in October of 2017. Um, and then so the next investigation was the House Assassination uh, Committee. And what they found was that it was a probable conspiracy. Just before them, the Church Committee found that the CIA was engaging in illegal behavior and had uh, taken part in executive action. So they banned executive action, which is the removal of a sitting uh, officer of a different country. So we couldn't go and assassinate somebody um, just because the intelligence told us they were gonna wage war or something. So um, that executive action part and that the CIA used the mafia to try to assassinate heads of state like Castro, for example, um, you know, that got us into a different territory in the 70s when the CIA was getting bottled up. We were starting to see exactly what they had been up to in fighting the Cold War and taking every liberty and shredding the Constitution. So we got into a situation where it started to become apparent uh, to anyone who was investigating, like the House Intelligence Committees, that the CIA was involved in the JFK assassination. And that's crucial because they would want to hide that, of course. And if there's any links to that in the records that Trump wouldn't release, that is the, a good, good reason for the CIA blocking them. Um, so when we get into the 1992 uh, period with Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, it is an interesting situation because what happens is the Congress gets all this public pressure and they, they say, OK, the JFK Records Act, in 25 years, we'll let it all out. And it'll come out October 26, 2017. Well, uh, I did a live stream on that day because I expected the records to come out. And they blocked the records. They said, we're going to do a rolling release of the records. But here's a couple of records, you know. And So, so you did the, the Geraldo Rivera tomb opening. <laughs> <laughs> did that go through your mind at that point? Well, what I was thinking was, uh, you know, I was trying to think of what excuse they could use. And they actually came forward and said, we want to keep until 2038. And Trump said, no, six months, we'll do it. Um, so then I did the Vice HBO special on November 22nd. And we talked about some of the things that we were discovering uh, about some of the older connections to the CIA keeping the records. 
And the fact uh, was that Joe and Nitties had not only run the Oswald Project in 1963, which is part of the records they want to keep, that Jefferson Morley is suing them for, but he also ran the he was the CIA liaison for the House Assassination Committee in the 70s. So they have controlled the ball about the information that gets let out about JFK's assassination. But let's think about it. I mean, that is the first real transgression, if you think about it, because that was a duly elected president by the people. And if the CIA had a role in removing him, it's 55 years later. It, you know, the transparency wall, uh, the secrecy wall needs to come down and the transparency needs to come through. So Trump had this opportunity uh, with the files and he decided to go along with the CIA and say, we'll hold them till 2021 after the next election. <laughs> mm. Now, do you think that what's in there is that people will question the CIA altogether? I mean, it'll be a big revolt against the CIA and that is something they don't want to deal with now? I think two things are in there that they're really worried about. One are the Garrison files, the set of files dealing with Jim Garrison. Um, the assistant to the CIA um, who put out a book in the 80s about working with them said that the CIA and Richard Helms, who was the CIA director at the time, had made major efforts to block uh, Garrison's investigation into the JFK assassination because it was going to expose people and their employ. So um, that's those records, I think, are significant, and they're going to show that there's a combination of forces involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. One, according to Garrison, it was a force inside of the aerospace companies that was particularly uh, enamored of the idea of getting rid of JFK. That I find very interesting because um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about relating to advanced technology – and the things that they wanted to hide uh, would get into why aerospace would have a motive for assassinating Kennedy. The other records uh, that they have held back no doubt relate to the fact that Oswald worked with the CIA in the first place and that he was one of their assets and that they had set him up to uh, appear as the patsy and uh, appear as the lone assassin, which was this ridiculous story that they've sold us for 50 years that no one has bought. And one of the things, the, the reasons I really kind of emphasize the JFK assassination, and one thing I think we should get on board with about this, it is the template. It is the deep state template for how business has been conducted ever since, you know. Um, and, and how do how do you say that? How what do you mean? Well, the idea and how is it that, the template? It's the template because if you can take uh, the public assassination of a president, uh, as we had in 1963, and the policy is getting reversed, so there's the public policy aspect getting changed immediately. On the plane. And, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And then that Sunday, they overturned his entire Vietnam policy. Uh, so he's get killed on Friday. It's, and then it's fast crazy action. that they, it wasn't so obvious at the time, but keep going. I mean, it is fascinating, but yeah. that's what gets us into Vietnam. So you can see it has a major impact the minute that these deep state events happen. Um, the next thing is the cover up. You put a committee together. They uh, kind of create the situation where you can't find the truth because they obfuscate it and they get the media on their side. And the media works. A lot of people have to understand this and I understood it when I worked in the mainstream media, which is that the Council on Foreign Relations controls the media because anyone who's anyone of significance in the media is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So if you do something outside of the bounds that they're comfortable with, you're out <laughs> and you won't have that access, et cetera. Uh, now, of course, we have this tremendous... CIA presence in the media, and that's too cozy a relationship. In some cases, the way I understand it is the CIA will give a story wholesale to the New York Times, and the New York Times will just write it wholesale as they're given it. So it's basically like a propaganda sheet. Um, so that type of situation, you know, is ongoing. Unfortunately, I'd like to think that, you know, they participated in the JFK assassination and the CIA cleaned its act up and everything's hunky dory. But all the same rules are in place. And let's look at what they did with Trump last year. They were trying to remove a duly elected president using things like a bogus um, Russian dossier and all the rest of it. So we see the same 
And if the if the if the way. alternative media wasn't as powerful, it would work. Right? I mean, that well, would a that, question, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, that whole <laughs> template would work. Just like 9/11, the alternative media kind of threw that off the tracks, but that was the same template they used for 9/11. Oh, it is. And look at the 9/11 commission. Uh, you know, there's so many things about 9-11, of course, we could do a whole show on that. Yes. But in any case, we didn't get the real truth. I think we can all agree on that. Um, well, but the same, they, it was the same template. It was. You, instead of the Warren Commission, you had the 9-11 Commission. And what was their conclusions? Well, it was a joke. You know, yeah. So their, their conclusion was that bin Laden created the entire scenario and that you had these guys who were able to get on planes and take over planes and fly them. Now, the United States has had protocols in place for those types of actions. It would never have gotten that far. It That's was a fact. joke. I mean, the whole yeah. thing, they were told to stand down. And there's so many facts that if anybody has a remote open mind, you know, critical thinking, not open mind, but a critical thinker and is willing to look at things an open mind in that way, um, you can't that you can't believe their official story. It's not possible. No, the story has so many holes in it. Yes. And you could say, you know, you can tra uh, track back and say, well, this is the reason that they hid these things. We don't have to go to what their reasons are, but we can say that they hid something. We can start with that. So we, we don't have to say they were in collusion, you know, that they made this happen. But whatever it was that happened, they hid it. Um, it's a pretty good guess that somehow there were forces inside of the government that were participating in it. Else, How else would you get it off the ground at that level? Well, don't so, you think that they almost have complete control of the mass media now? Because journalism, investigative journalism, like what you're doing, what you just did with this whole X series just doesn't exist anymore. And they get their stuff from the news feeds. All the places everywhere get their stuff from the news feeds. And then they just print that. They're money making organizations. They don't want to spend any more time than they need to. They get it from the news feeds. It's good enough. We don't care. We're printing it. Those news feeds are controlled by the CIA and they do some investigative journalism up there. Just what is okay to do. But it's a small control group of people. No question. I mean, the Council on Foreign Relations aspect is important because basically uh, that is a think tank, but the amount of influential people that are involved with it uh, over and over again, you know, if you are a member of the media and you join the CFR, uh, really there's no way to get around it because you're going to talk about what they want you to talk about. You know, I made the example of Anderson Cooper. Okay, Anderson Cooper, who came from all this Vanderbilt money, had this incredible career at CNN and all this stuff. And what does he wind up doing? He winds up talking about condoms with Stormy Daniels. Oh, that right? was terrible. I mean, it's pretty low. I mean, is that the level? So that you go through your whole life. What kind of accomplishment is that? So how controlled do you need to be? You know, you can go through and you can try to do all these things journalistically. But if you just become some plaything for uh, the deep state to move you through the media. But let's look at the media in a real practical sense, because there's been massive consolidation the way that you've, you've talked about it. And what we really need to understand is they have reasons for doing that, because if they can control the narrative, then they have the ability to control events so they don't have to do things uh, for changing public policy. It's not as difficult for them. It's much easier. Um, when they ran smack into two major factors in the 2016 election, which changed the paradigm, and it's why they're on such a crackdown against the in independent media, um, they ran into the fact that they could not usher in Hillary Clinton just by the weight of their reporting, that there was a force out there that was going to question what was going on and it was going to, you know, it was a combination of factors. WikiLeaks was an important factor, releasing their emails and letting us see exactly the kind of corruption that was going on there. But the other factor was that the uh, independent media was so lined up against it and helped to reveal so many different things like what we talked about. The question is, though, all the clampdowns and all the, the pushing back by the mainstream media against the independent media um, it might get more and more difficult to have a 2016 election where the independent media has a voice to that level. And that's what they want to stop, really. That's why we saw them trying to uh, create this whole red scare, you know, and like 
uh, anyone who's with Trump is with the Russians. You know, it sounded like 50s McCarthyism. Right? It was absolutely absurd. Do you think that they've just controlled it with algorithms, too? I mean, because they had this big crackdown where they deleted channels and things like that. So maybe that's a whole preparing so that this will never happen again. Well, fundamentally, let's go back to the Constitution. They understood, uh, the framers of the Constitution understood that you needed an open, fair media if you were going to have, because they had dealt with King George and they, they understood that, you know, you say the wrong thing, you get rounded up. So they said, we need to have free speech. We need to have functioning press. Now, um, they said that it was just as important as any legislative branch of government to have the ability to, you know, have this media going out there and telling people the truth so they can make up their own minds. So when you move to get rid of that by censoring uh, YouTube channels, when you try to eliminate people from saying certain phrases on Twitter, and they've done great undercover stings of people at Twitter and at Google saying that, you know, we need to shut down this particular point of view. And very often it is a liberal conservative thing, um, you know, that it's, they want to really shut down these particular memes that are coming out that aren't something that are to their liking. So they might be alt-right memes, whatever they happen to be. In any case, it doesn't matter. You know, it's free speech. Just like I say for people who don't like Trump, you know, well, even if you don't like him, I'm sure you don't want the CIA to remove a duly elected president. So it get back, uh, the whole thing gets back to the Constitution ultimately, because this whole thing about the media and the control of the media is why I got into dark journalism, because what I see it really is that you have a couple of different sides that you're fighting against. You've got the mainstream media coming down and telling you what to think. And then when you're trying to find the real story in the middle, you've got this other aspect, what I call junk conspiracy, which operates right beneath the mainstream media and very often drives people back to the mainstream media because they think, oh, well, this is too wild a conspiracy. I'm going to go back to normal, safe mainstream media. So I made up rules when I did dark journalists. I said, well, there's the official story that's put in place by the establishment to kind of save individuals and, uh, you know, to, to keep the status quo going. And then beneath that, there was the counter story, which is brought forward by intelligent people uh, who are doing real reporting, like what we're talking about here. And, you know, like a Peter Dale Scott type person. They'll be professors, they'll be authors, they'll be people who understand that the mainstream media isn't giving them the whole truth. And very often the media will brand them as conspiracy theorists, and there's that whole dynamic. But the junk conspiracy is very interesting, and you and I talk about this a lot, which is these things come out of the blue, and they are to discredit that second level of investigation. And uh, I call it third force, because it's, it's the level, it's the third level. The mainstream media uh, official story, the counter story, and then this third force comes out. And the third force junk conspiracy, uh, you know, the JFK uh, assassination has one, which is the driver did it, right? I mean, it's this thing that uh, will come out and just circulate, and you'll be like, what is going on here? And people look at this crazy story and say, oh, I, I'm going to fall asleep again and go back to the mainstream media. I can't deal with that conspiracy stuff. So it's very effective. And um, we've seen it over and over again. And I think it's something that if we can expose it, you know, we were talking about flat earth as one of these. Um, these are things that are very likely cooked up in intelligence agencies to silence and connect uh, people who are criticizing them with far out crazy theory. Do you think, because when I hear some of the things like that, I, I get these comments, the rudest comments on my comment boards oh, yeah. that are like outrageous. I'm almost to the point where I think some of those are bots. You know, the rudest Absolutely. out there comments. It's also when you talk about Zionism, you'll get these rude comments against Jewish people that yes. I think that's bots or it's on purpose to make everybody seem like they're crazy that's even involved in the, the community uh, boards. Yeah. Well, look, I've seen studies where they say over half of online activity is bots. Uh, so there's no question about it. There's also something that Cheryl Atkinson, who does a lot of independent journalism since she quit CBS, she calls it astroturfing. And it is uh, when a major corporation 
goes through and hires these people out to comment on things and they're not really making comments against an independent product. What they are are corporate agents going in to try to make this independent thing look bad. So that kind of astroturfing we do see when you get into the independent media, of course, uh, there's a lot of hot button issues like what you're talking about. You say one thing and all this other stuff comes up and it's really through comment boards that they control things. Um, but there's such a crackdown in Google and YouTube that I do think that things are going to migrate onto other platforms. I'm a great fan of how uh, YouTube operates. And you and I, uh, we do our shows through YouTube. And I think it is the most open format. But I think what's happening is the political situation is going to cause a kind of clampdown um, to continue. And, you know, it's one thing like to say people should be responsible with their media. I agree with that, you know, and I don't think anyone should jump to a false flag conclusion about everything that happens. It's that's again, I think that's a lot of junk conspiracy. And we get we see levels of junk conspiracy that come up a lot. So with the kind of work that I do, not only do you have to kind of battle this wave of conformity to the mainstream media, but you also have to see your way through the kind of psyop junk conspiracy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's it's hard. The line that you and I need to walk down. It's really hard because, you know, the listeners don't know who's real and who's not. Well, we don't know really either. I mean, we're doing the best True. we can. You know, yeah. we're, we being very critical and we're doing what we can, but we don't know if a guest is a game playing on us. Excellent point. And the, I mean, uh, we always go back to the main rules of good journalism, which is you do real critical thinking, you come up with evidentiary uh, sources, you do your research, you talk to people, you get the right experts to come and talk to you. Um, that's the kind of thing that creates a thriving situation. And it's so dynamic and it can make such a difference as we've seen in 2016, as we've seen um, even in the major financial meltdown of 2008. These independent voices come out and come forward and tell us what really happened and what's really going on and how the Federal Reserve had a, a major role in bailing out these foreign companies and not giving that kind of information to the Congress. These things are crucial, and you're only going to find them in the independent space. Uh, so the independent space, although it can be a little bit like a Wild West thing, it is not uh, encumbered. It doesn't have the restraints that the mainstream media has. So therefore, you still have the ability to get the truth there. Exactly. Which I think is crucial. Yeah. Exactly. And the, main, the mainstream media will tell you the truth about basic things. You know, they'll give you the truth uh, <laughs> if you want to know the weather, if you want to know uh, how the stock market's doing. Uh, all that stuff is rock solid, you know. But if you want to go into anything deeper about the system of power that operates through the government, uh, you're not going to find it there. Well, it's going to take those independent voices, yeah. I did a show on how you can, you can see if you're being taken for a ride and what makes good journalism. And, you know, you can be taken for a ride by individual people, but you have to, like you said, get alternate sources and you, you kind of look at their pattern. Have they told the truth in the past and then get alternate sources on a continuous basis? Cause that's how the CIA works. They, they'll tell the truth all the way. So you, you believe them and then they throw in a couple lies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always lies mixed with truth. I mean, I, I take the secret space program research as a takeoff point. Because in that research, uh, you have Gary McKinnon, who hacked into NASA, and told us the fundamentals behind the idea that black budget money was going into a separate space program uh, beyond NASA. And that it wasn't, although it was using public money, it wasn't being um, reported to the public, and the public was seeing no benefit from it. So, uh, a lot of that research came through Catherine Austin Fitz and Joseph Farrell and people like that. And that was a, a solid foundation um, for a number of shows that I did, including Secret Space Program and Continuity of Government, which is my presentation on it. And the amazing thing is that soon after that came out, this other weird version of the Secret Space Program came out, which had people saying, oh, I'm a galactic ambassador and, you know, I'm getting messages from Mars and stuff like that. 
And it was you mean the ones that are using the Guardians of the Galaxy poster to do their advertisement yes, exactly. <laughs> with their faces on, <laughs> on the I, characters? I, but anyways. <laughs> but just, yeah, I, we know it quite well, yeah. Um, and I've, you know, of course, I've tangled uh, with those groups before. But my point about it is this, which is when you get into an area that is sensitive on a government level, they're happy to support things that muck up the trail, that obfuscate the trail. Uh, and it's very interesting that there are always marketing forces out there that are happy to clean up and, and make money from doing that. So a good, honest a media that's studying the real uh, nature of power on planet Earth and the economic system, the real economic system, um, that's a big threat. And that's why forces like the mainstream media have to work overtime to get rid of us one way or another through like algorithms or, you know, just giving the whole topic a hard time. And they've tried over and over again to get rid of the independent media since the end of the 2016 election uh, so far with no real victories. But um, I would say that uh, they're targeting more and more. Well, Daniel, we're running out of time, but I really want you back soon. So we're going to yeah. schedule something right away and okay. we're going to do you, you a, a quick Patreon question for my patrons, which thank you so much for doing that. And yes. um, thank you so much for coming today. Sarah, it's great to see you.